Okay, so with this video, we're going to start talking about chapter 5. We're going to begin a new chapter. And this chapter is about uh, adversarial searches. And these are the type of searches that you have when you're playing a game, essentially. Right? So this chapter is going to be about you know, low-tech gameplay. I'm going to have an introduction uh, to how you can create an AI to play a simple game uh, against you. Right, so here's the topics we're going to cover, the sections from this chapter. We're not going to do the entire thing. Uh, we're going to go through these sections. So section 5.1, just a brief introduction to what a game is, how you can define a game, right? And some things to, to keep in mind, uh, just some points, you know, talk about what games are. Uh, section 5.2, talking about making optimal decisions in games. You know, what's the best move that the AI could make? Okay, so basically what this is going to boil down to is you're going to be creating a search tree, right? And you're going to have your AI uh, that's going to play out a bunch of moves in its head, right? It's going to go through and simulate a whole bunch of different games, you know, maybe taking into consideration if you have a game that's going to run 200 turns, then the AI in its mind is going to go through and play out all 200 turns of that game and maybe play that game like 20 times right and so based off of the results of all those turns for all those games it's going to decide on what its best move is that it should take right now against you so it's going to be a type of a search problem okay and we're going to find that um, just like with anything else we've studied so far, you have this trade-off between, you know, time and you know, finding the best answer or the optimal solution. So we'll look at an algorithm for trying to find the optimal decision that the AI could make when it's the AI's turn. And so that's what section 5.2 gets us uh, going on, and that is optimal decisions in games, right? So basically. You know, long story short, we're gonna look at an algorithm called Minimax, and that algorithm is gonna go through and play out all the different moves that could possibly be made until the end of the game, and then find the best end game state for the AI, and then take a move uh, on its turn that's gonna get it one step closer to that best possible ending. And so, you know, if you're playing against the AI, what's going to happen is, is it's going to say, all right, well, if I take this turn, if I take this action, if I put my checker here, right, then I have to take into consideration, well, what would my opponent do in response, right? And so that'd be two turns into the future. And then the AI would say, well, what would I do in response to my opponent's response? And so that's the third turn into the future. And then the AI would say, well, what would my opponent do in response to the response to the response of my move, right? And so it just goes back and forth, playing out the entire series of moves for a game until it gets to an end state of the game, right? And then it evaluates that state. And if it's favorable, then it'll know to go ahead and take that action that would be the first move in the series of moves that leads you to the end of the game, right? So that's very resource intensive, as you can imagine. So a big part of the challenge is trying to figure out, well, how can you minimize that um, resource use, right? So one way of doing that is through pruning. And as it turns out, logically, uh, when trying to figure out what moves you're gonna do by, you know, in your mind playing all these different games, you're gonna create the search tree. And as it turns out, there's certain subtrees within that search that you just don't even need to consider. Because going down that path, you know, your opponent would never take a particular move in response to your move, for example. And so you don't have to play out the rest of that game, right? You don't have to play out the rest of that game as it manifests itself through a subtree. And so you don't have to generate all the nodes in that subtree, right? So you can prune that stuff off. So disregarding whole subtrees of your search tree. So alpha beta pruning uh, is an algorithm that helps you to do that. It's a modification to uh, an algorithm that we'll look at to the minimax algorithm uh, that'll, that we'll use or we'll study that is going to help the AI to decide what move it should make. Um, section 5.4, imperfect real-time decisions. 
So in uh, an attempt to cut down on the overall size of the search space, the search tree that the AI will have to generate, uh, you can sacrifice optimality of a move for time, right, for resources. So rather than playing out an entire game, several games worth, right, multiple times, uh, maybe you just say, well, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm only gonna think, instead of taking 200 turns of this game in my head, I'll take 20, right? And that could be good enough, right? And so that'll save me a whole bunch of time in deciding, right? It'll save the AI a whole bunch of time in deciding what move it should take but you may not get the best move, right? So you're sacrificing the best move for speeding things up. You know, thinking 10 moves ahead instead of 100 moves ahead, that kind of thing, right? So section 5.5 is about stochastic games. Stochastic games, remember sto stochastic just means randomness, die rolls, backgammon, for example, rolling two dice, uh, monopoly rolling two dice, or where's the piece gonna move, or what types of moves can uh, the AI make, right? In backgammon, roll two dice, you can move checkers in different combinations, or I guess not checkers, but the pieces in backgammon, whatever those are called, right? Uh, and then we'll finish up with a summary of what we talked about. Okay, so section 5.1, games, right? So here's some points to consider when talking about games. Right, so if you're in an environment where you got more than one agent, right, you're in the so-called multi-agent environment, right? So if the agents in that environment, if they are all trying to pursue different goals, if there are um, you know, things that they are trying to do that are conflicting with each other, right? If that's the case, then you have a competitive environment. So you've got an environment, multiple agents, they're all trying to achieve their own aims, um, and those aims are in conflict with each other, you have a competitive environment, right? So environments that have those characteristics basically lead you to, you know, adversarial searches, right? So you have to do searches. What that means is that you have to do searches that take into consideration what other agents are going to do in that environment, right? So when uh, dealing with problems like this, what we're dealing with are games, right? So consider tic-tac-toe, right? There's going to be actions that the AI will take. I'm going to put my X in the center square. I'm going to put my X in the upper left-hand square, right? But then another agent whose goal is to win the game, right? The AI is goal is to win the game, right? Um, they have conflicting goals, right? They both can't win. And so the AI says, I'm gonna put my X in the center square. But as it builds its search tree, it then has to consider, well, what's my opponent gonna do? What's the other agent gonna do? Where's that O gonna go, right? And then once the opponent puts their O somewhere, well then where am I gonna put my next X? Uh, and so on, right, until the game is over. So, you know, that's a type of problem where we have an adversary, where you've got the AI and it has an opponent and it has to take into consideration what its opponent could do, right? So, in game theory, mathematical game theory, um, it's a game if you have such an environment, it's got multiple agents in it, and the decisions that each agent makes can impact other agents. Now in that case, in that context, whether they're competitive or not doesn't matter, right? So another definition um, here, or another way of looking at it, mathematical game theory, hey, I got a couple different agents or multiple agents all in the same environment, and whatever they decide to do, that has an impact on other agents in that environment. Whether they're in competition, whether they're cooperating, doesn't matter. That's mathematical game theory. Okay, so when studying games or common games in the context of AI, most of the time what you're talking about are deterministic games, right? Deterministic. 
So the player decides they're going to take their move and their move is going to resolve as expected. You know, if um, decide, if the AI decides that X is going in the center square, X is going in the center square. Okay, deterministic. It's not like there's a random chance that the AI says, I want the X in the center square. And at random, it ends up in the top middle square or something like that, right? That's not going to happen here. So deterministic, you decide to put the X in a particular square, and that's where that X is going. Uh, turn taking, I go, you go, right? So the AI takes its turn, the human takes its turn, or if it's a multi-agent -invade, uh, environment where each of those agents are controlled by their own individual AI, you know, agent zero takes its turn, agent one takes its turn, agent two takes its turn, fine. Um, but most of the time in AI, we're talking about deterministic turn taking, but with two players, right? So say AI and human, or two AIs playing against each other. Okay, uh, in addition, there's zero sum games, right? Which with zero sum basically means I win or you win, right? There's a loser and there's a winner kind of thing, right? And they are games that have perfect information, right? So um, there's no guesswork going on. Uh, you, know, you know the rules of the game, you know uh, it's X and O, you know there's gonna be so many turns, Right, that, that sort of thing. So some examples are chess. You know, chess is, a, is, is, is probably the most famous, right? Because IBM uh, made Big Blue to beat you know, human chess champions. And we're at a point in the technology now, humans can't beat the AI. They, they can't do it. It's impossible. Uh, but checkers is another example you know, the, of the type of game we're talking about here. Reversi, sometimes known as Othello, it's another example. Um, basically, another way to put this is, you know, deterministic. We have deterministic, fully observable environments where agents are swapping turns and you have utility values for the end of the game, at the end of the game, where they're equal and opposite. So, you know, I kind of just read that to you, but what does it mean, right? Because the language is very, very distinct there. What does it mean? One player wins, the other loses, that's it, right? You're gonna have one clear winner, you're gonna have one clear loser. Taking turns, at the end, someone wins, someone lose, loses, right? So if I got two players, I got X, I got O, right? The utility value for X is gonna be completely opposite and equal of the utility value for O in terms of the end game, right? So one player wins, one player loses. That's the way it's going to be. All right. So um, these types of problems, very, very, very interesting, right? They're good to study. They're 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 good to work on because they're hard, right? We choose to go to the moon in this generation not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Um, that's the whole point. It's not easy, right? And so. Even games that seem like they're going to be simple on their face, there's a lot going on, right? So here's three points to that, or three examples, right? Chess, branching factor, average, 35. Remember what branching factor means? That means that for any node representing a particular state, on average, there's going to be 35 child nodes generated, 35 nodes in its frontier. That's a big number. Um, you have to make a decision, right? The game, the AI is going to have to make a decision. And it could be the case that finding the optimal decision, the best decision, the best action to take might take too long, right? And so you have to come up with ways of cutting down on that decision making time, right? So, you know, that makes game playing problems interesting. And games themselves, they're gonna they're gonna punish you if you're inefficient, right? If um, I'm playing StarCraft, for example, and my build order gets me ten Space Marines, uh, and in two minutes, and my opponent's build order gets in twenty in the same amount of time, I'm gonna get creamed, right? So. If my opponent can generate assets faster than I can based off of their choices, I'm going to get creamed. You're going to get penalized if you're not as efficient as possible, right? So 
some things that you're thinking about that you're considering or that the AI has to consider. What's my best move here, right? What is the best move? Um, how do I figure out what that move's gonna be, right? Um, you know, you know, like I was saying before, spoiler, we're gonna have a search algorithm. Uh, we're gonna generate a tree and we're gonna search it. How do you decide? You know, there's gonna be a move, you only have so much time, you can't sit there and wait for the computer to play or to search through this ginormous tree, It'd take two hours to take its turn. Human being ain't gonna wait two hours for the computer to make up its mind as to what turn uh, it's gonna take, right? Think about AIs for games like, you know, StarCraft or, or Civilization or what whatnot, right? Those are really complex games. Chess, really complex game. You know, you as a player, you're not gonna wait for the AI to decide that it's gonna build um, a granary or that it's going to, um, you know, take its resource gathering unit and, you know, mine that node. You're not gonna wait two hours to figure that out, right? So what are some strategies for dealing with all of these issues? You know, finding the best move. Um, how do we figure out what that best move is? How do we make a decision when the time is limited? So, you know, continuing the kind of this introductory discussion, you know, here's some ideas, and I mentioned them a little bit at the very beginning, pruning, pruning, right? So pruning is a technique that will allow you to disregard um, subtrees within the subtree. You can ignore parts of your search tree. Logically, you can determine that going down a particular path in the tree isn't going to be any better than some other path, right? And so why look at it at all? If I know that a particular path in my search tree is going to guarantee me a losing state, then forget about it. Don't even worry about it. Okay, so heuristic evaluation functions. So by having a good evaluation function, one that can make the best guess as to what a potential outcome could be, you can score a move without having to go through an entire search, without having to fill out the entire uh, search tree, right? Generating every single node. So combination of pruning, um, having a function to help you make a good guess about a move, that can cut down on the amount of time it takes for the AI to make a decision on a move um, substantially, right? So in addition, some games, they're gonna have to deal with a situation where they don't have perfect information. So think about solitaire, right? You can't see all those cards at once. Think about any, you know, war game where you, the fog of war is at play. Until you move uh, one of your units to uncover some of the fog of war, you don't know what's going on over there, right? Unless you have some kind of a spy unit to go sit in your enemy's base, you're not gonna know what your enemy's doing. So some games, depending on what they are, they're not gonna have perfect information, right? You can't know everything there is to know all at once. Okay, so to get started, let's consider a game that has two players, right? So just some generic game, right? And so we'll refer to one of those players as Min, refer to the other player as Max. Okay, so for this particular game, Max is going to take its turn first, right? So from there, turns are going to alternate. Max goes first, then Min, then Max, then Min, then Max till the game's over, whatever that means. Okay, now you're gonna give points to the player that wins and you're gonna penalize the player that loses, right? If you have those factors, if you have those characteristics, the game can be framed in terms of a search problem, right? We're gonna need to do some searching. Okay, so let's consider the properties of this search problem, right? So framing it using the same kind of language that we've had from earlier chapters all along, right? So what's the initial state? Call it S sub zero, right? So that's gonna be the game setup. So initial state for tic-tac-toe, for example, empty board, right? Uh, checkers, each player's pieces in their correct positions. If it's chess, you know, you got the knight, the pawns, the king, the rooks, bishops, all that stuff, all in their uh, correct 
place, right? So what are some functions that we'll need for this problem? We can have a player function, right? And so what's its responsibility? What it's, what's its task? Its responsibility is to determine which player's turn it is. Is it Min's turn or is it Max's turn, right? Feed it a state, and then based off of that state, whose turn is it, okay? So we'll have an action function like we've had in previous uh, problems in the previous uh, search algorithms. Um, so what's that doing? You're feeding a state, and that's going to tell you all the legal moves that you can make, right? So if Max is the player in the tic-tac-toe game being represented by X, and you feed it a state where the board's got nothing on it, all the squares are blank, then that action function is going to return um, a list of all of the actions that X could take. So what would some of those actions be? Put X in the center. Put X in the upper left-hand corner. Put X in the upper right-hand corner, uh, and so on. Right. So what about our transition model? Well, we've got that result function again, similar to what we've had in the previous problems. Given a state S and an action A, what's the result, right? So that function would return the updated state, right? So if I fed the result function as arguments, the state with a blank board and an action indicating that X should go in the middle, then what's going to come out of this result function? What's going to return the state with the x in the middle? Okay, and that defines our transition model. So, a new function called terminal test. Terminal test. So, this function is trying to see if the game's over. Okay, so any state that ends the game are referred to as terminal states. Game's over. Terminated. You've been terminated, right? You've been talking to for termination. It's over. Right? So maybe my cheesy Arnold accent will help you remember that. Uh, so the terminal test function, you feed it a state, S, and if that state is a terminal state, game's over. Right? So uh, some examples, tic-tac-toe. Right? You got the board filled up. No matter if somebody won, lost, or that's a tie. It doesn't matter. It's a terminal state. Right? There are no more... Uh, possible moves that can be made. Game's over. Board's filled up. Um, another terminal state would be if X had tic-tac-toe three in a row. Could be that there's still some blank squares left. So what? So what? Doesn't matter. It's over. Game's over. Three in a row. Uh, maybe O has three in a row. And there's still three blank spaces. So what? Game's over. Terminal test. Right? Uh, let's see here. So going to have a utility function and that utility function is our objective function right this thing is going to be figuring out a score right so um, pass it the player whose turn it is um, either min or max that's what the piece for s the state and that utility function will return some value that indicates how valuable that state is from the perspective of player P, right? So tic-tac-toe, three in a row, three X's in a row. If Max is the X player, then that's gonna have a high value as far as Max is concerned. It's gonna have a really bad value as far as Min, if Min is the O player, right? So the X player, three X's in a row, thousand points, right? Um, for the O player, three X's in a row in that state, negative a thousand, right? Um, equal and opposite value. So the utility function is giving a score for a state from the perspective of one of the players, from one of the players, okay? So here's some examples for the score, right? In chess, right? If, you know, the black player, right, is uh, evaluating the value of a state maybe that state has the white king in checkmate. Well, that's a plus one for the black player, right? Um, for the white player, right, that'd be zero. It's a loss, it's bad, okay? Um, 
you know, maybe that particular state would be a tie. Well, a half point, right? So from both players' perspectives, um, you know, it's it's better than a loss, but you know, not as good as a win. So somewhere in the middle. Maybe in backgammon, you return a score from zero to 192 based off of the position of uh, the checkers, right? Or the pieces, whatever they're called back in, right? So zero sum game, kind of told you about this uh, before, you know, the zero sum game, you're gonna have a winner, you're gonna have a loser, chess, that's zero sum, right? So, you know, if you start off with a sum of zero because nothing has been figured out yet, well, you could have zero plus one, if uh, you know that's going to be, you know, the white player winning, or you could have one plus zero if that's going to be the black player winning, or one half plus one half, right? So half goes to the black player, half goes to the white player, right? So zero sum, um, you're going to have some outcome. There's some score that that can be distributed, and you know, based off of that um, utility function. You know, you'd be evaluating that from player P uh, for a particular state from player P's point of view, okay? Okay, so the total payoff, zero-sum game, total payoff to all players is the same for each game instance, right? And then it has to be divided up, as I just explained with the chess is zero-sum example, okay? So here is an example of the tic-tac-toe um, game tree defined by the actions function, the results function, and the initial state. Okay, so I want to take a little bit of a detour here and kind of uh, draw this tree out a little bit and explain as I go. And, um, you know, then I'll go back to the figure and, you know, finish to, to finish the example off. But, you know, let's say that we're playing tic-tac-toe, right? Let's say that uh, we've got the two players, uh, Max and Min, and we'll say that um, Max is going to be the X player, okay? And Min is going to be the O player, okay? So if Max starts the game, right, and our initial state is an empty board, right? So we'll call that state zero, okay? Then we would feed that state, right, into our actions function, right? The actions function, that initial state. And so Max is trying to figure out well, what turn do I need to take here, right? So we feed that in and the action function is going to return a list of everything that we could do, right? So um, maybe we could label, you know, this square is square one, this one is two, this one is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So if we do that, then we could do something like this. Maybe we could encode our action as uh, x to square one, right? So if that's the case, that would be one action we could take. We could have another action, x to square two. We could have another action, x to square uh, three, uh, and so forth, right? All the way through x to square nine, right? So maybe that's how we encode it, maybe even as a string or something, right? So if we do that, then we could take each one of those actions and we could feed them to our result function, right? For each one of those actions. So we would take state sub zero, right? The initial state. And if you apply an action x1 to it, you'd get a new state. That would be the result, right? So what would that new state be, right? It would be the board with x in the upper left-hand corner. Right? Now, what if I did the same thing for action x2, right? If I do that, then I've got 
the state where x is in the uh, upper middle um, square, right? And similarly with x3, you know, I end up with a state where the x is in the upper right-hand corner. I mean, for all of these guys, right? I mean, there's nine possible moves. There's nine places where the x could go all the way through the state where x is in the bottom right-hand corner, right? Now, if I was to encode these uh, states, how could I do it, right? I'll give you an example of maybe here's how I did the action, maybe just a string x1. Well, it could be that, you know, the board itself is encoded as um, you know, an array, right? Where each element is storing a character, right? So I'd have some more, I'd have some more elements here, but you know, so for this state right here, maybe call it, refer to it as, as sub one, you know, that would mean that we put the character X here, right? Um, that would represent the state for S sub one. And then maybe, uh, the next state, right, refer to it as S sub two. Well, maybe that's an array where you put X in the second element um, and so on, right? Now, Max takes that, decides that it has to take one of these moves, right? So it's gonna continue playing out and alternating moves. So, you know, if, if Max starts out with this very first empty state, figure out what all of your actions are, all of your possible actions that you can take from there are x1, x2, x3, all the way through x9, right? But in response, min is gonna have to take a move, right? And before x actually decides on which action it takes, it has to take into consideration everything that min might do in response, right? So you're gonna, recursively apply actions and results again, but this time, basically, you're using it to consider what min's possible move might be. So, if we were to pass state S sub one, for example, to actions, right? Then all the possible actions that could be taken by the min player O in response could be something like this, right? Here's one possible response. And let's go ahead and place O in square two, right? And so feed that action into the results function. What's the state that you end up with? That one right there, right? What would be another possible action that could be returned from the actions function? Well, maybe O in square three. So here is the updated state that would be returned by the results function, right? And then maybe you have another action, which is O to go to square four. So what would result return for that? Well, X is still in the upper left hand corner and then O is now in that spot. Um, and so on, right? And so you'd have to do that in response to each state at the level above, right? So we'd have to do that. We'd have to say, well, what is min gonna do if we move, uh, if, if, if I put my X in that upper left-hand corner? What are all the possible responses um, O could take? And similarly, you know, we'd have to go through every single one of these states and do the same thing to where, you know, what would be a possible response if I put my X in that bottom right-hand corner? Well, now the list of legal actions is gonna change, right? Because you can no longer place an O in square nine, right? So that's not a valid action anymore. So the actions function is gonna return something different for the state right here, which I'll call a uh, state, I don't know, nine, right? So for state nine, that actions function is going to return a different list of potential actions. Okay, whereas for state one, it would return actions 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 6, 0, 7, 0, 8, 0, 9, and by 0, I mean, oh, sorry. 
um, vine for um, for this state here, state S sub 9, then the valid actions would be 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, right? So that becomes the first valid action. And if you feed that to your results function, what comes out? A state where O is in the upper left-hand corner and X is in the lower right-hand corner, right? O2, feed that along with state S sub 9 to your result function results in O in a state where O is in the upper middle square and X is still in the bottom, right? right? Um, all the way until the last possible action. Now the last possible valid action to get from state S9 uh, to a new state would be O in square eight, right? Why? Because square nines are already taken by X. Right? So the new state that would result by applying action 08 to state S sub 9 is this guy right there. Now how might that state be represented in memory? Well that state, right, again, could be an array, could be a whole bunch of different ways. You could represent this whole bunch of different ways, right, where you got an O there and you got an X there. Okay, fine. Um, in Lisp, you could create an actual list. Right, where maybe you've got, you're using underscores to represent blanks, right? and then uh, you got an O and you got an X, or in Python or whatever. Okay, And so this is just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, you're going to hit a terminal state. right? Let's say this subtree continues, and eventually you end up with a state getting generated that looks, I don't know, maybe like this. Right? Maybe it looks like that. Well, in this state, um, if we value a win for x as plus 1, for max, that utility function is going to return plus 1. And so that would say, well, this is a good state for me. This is a goal. That's going to be a win for me. Now, what action from the very, very, very beginning, right? Because keep in mind what's going on here. The game just started. This is a search tree that the AI is doing to determine what its very first move should be. And so, based off of this search and generating these nodes, we end up with a terminal state where X is the winner. Now, what was the first action that led us down that subtree to that leaf? X1. So what do you think the move should be for Max? Put X in that upper left-hand corner, right? And so that would be the end of the AI's turn. Human player takes their turn, and then it goes again, and then you repeat, right? Now it could be that maybe, you know, going down this subtree, going down this path, you end up with a state that looks like this, right? Um, where X is. Uh, I don't know, maybe something like this, and you got three O's here, right? So from X's point of view, that'd be minus one, right? So um, if it was a state that looks like this, where your terminal state ends up here, you know, forgetting that this exists, then you wouldn't want to necessarily have the AI put the X here because you know, based off of your simulation, that you end up at a losing state. So you might want to look at using one of these other actions instead, right? Now it could be the case that you end up in a subtree where there's a tie, right? Maybe it's zero x zero x zero x x zero x. That's a tie, right? So that might be valued at zero, right? Now if there is a move that leads you to a leaf where everything is, or where all the leaves are down this subtree where they're all valued at minus one, for example. But if you take this move, if the AI takes this move, and all the leaves end up uh, in that subtree, 
all the leaves in that subtree end up to be valued at zero, we'll guess which move the AI is going to take. It's not going to take action X1, it's going to take action X9, right? So from Max's point of view, this is a better move. X9 is a better move because um, if that path, if all these paths down that subtree led to ties as opposed to losses, well, you're going to take this move right here. The AI is going to take that move right there. Okay. Okay, so let me bring you back to the slides now to the figure 5.1, right? So this is still a partial game tree for tic-tac-toe, right? I started one off um, with that example on the whiteboard, right? So Max's turn, Max is playing X, initial state, blank board, okay? So the AI has to generate all of the possible actions. Remember the edges are representing all the possible actions. Where are the actions? X going there, upper left hand corner, X going in the top middle, upper right, etc. right? So the search tree proceeds by saying, all right, well, generate this virtual state for me, right? This is the actual state I'm working with right now. And now I have to think all my moves ahead. So generate all these virtual states for me, right? Generating all these nodes that are gonna build, be building our tree, um, and, you know, one node, one state at a time. So if this was the move the AI was gonna take, well then man who's playing O would have to make some counter moves, right? And so this is where kind of the recursion comes in because now from Min's point of view, it has to generate all of the possible actions that it could take in response, right? So Max is playing, you know, you know, the its own turn, but it's also saying, well, what would my opponent do, right? So it's kind of playing both sides. So in response to Max putting the X in the upper left-hand corner, then O, Min's, the Min player, might put that O in the upper middle square, upper right-hand corner square. Um, left column, middle row, square, and so forth, right? But the search isn't done yet because then, well, what would Max do in response to that? Well, X might go in the upper right-hand corner, uh, might go in the middle row, left column, might go in the very center, right? And this whole tree gets filled out, right, in this way until you reach all of your leaves, all of your leaves have been generated and those leaves represent the different types of terminal states, right? So, you know, one particular terminal state um, from Max's point of view, because Max is running this tree, is generating this tree, three O's in a row, minus one, that's, that's its utility value. Terminal test says this is a terminal state. From Max's point of view, what's it worth? Minus one. Okay, what about this terminal state? From Max's point of view, well, it's a tie. So zero, right? Because nobody won, that's better than a loss. Well, what about this terminal state? Well, that's that's a win, three X's in a row. So that's worth plus one. So Max would choose, you know, an action for its initial state. Remember its initial state was this blank board that could lead it down the subtree leading to this win. So based off of just what we have in this partial tree, it deciding the action of putting X in the upper left-hand corner, not necessarily a bad play because there is a win there, right? But if all of the leaves were negative one, then you're better off looking elsewhere. You know, maybe going and putting the X in the top middle uh, square because its subtree leads to all leaves being plus one, for example. Okay, so some notes about that tree. Max is starting. There's nine moves it can make possible, right? Why? Because nine squares. Okay, play is alternating, right? Max is playing this game out in its head. If I put X here, what's O gonna do? And then what will I do in response to, to O doing that and so forth? Okay. If the play ends, you're at a leaf node, right? It's either a tie, it's a win, or it's a loss. 
the leaves are going to be terminal states. You're going to have three in a row for X, you're going to have three in a row for O, or you're going to have cat's eye. Cat's eye just means uh, tie. So those numbers on the leaves, those are the utility values from Max's point of view in this example. High values are good for Max, low values are good for, for uh, Min. Now, that tree is going to, in terms of tic-tac-toe, for tic-tac-toe, pretty small overall, fairly speaking, fairly small, right? Nine factorial terminal nodes, manageable, doable. Now, what about the size of the tree for chess, following the same kind of idea? For chess, it would be, well, what if I move this pawn here, one square forward? What if I move that same pawn two squares forward? What if I move the pawn next to it one square forward? What if I move the pawn next to it two squares forward? You can imagine that that's going to create right, a huge number of um, nodes in its frontier. right? So how many nodes are you going to end up with right? for all the terminal nodes, I should say? Right? How many terminal nodes are you going to end up with? For chess, it's huge, 10 to the 40th. That's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, 40 times, right? All right, so, you know, the, this tree, you know, you think about it, I mean, the tree that's being created, um, theoretical, which means that it's, it's gonna be virtual, right? This is, this is the max player when it's its turn saying, okay, what are all the possible moves that can happen? What are all the outcomes of all those moves, right? And what's, which subtree gives me the best outcome. Let's take that state that's part of that subtree that gives me the best outcome. Okay, So super uh, search tree, that's going to be a tree that's superimposed on the game tree, right? So all the possible moves you're doing is you're doing your search. Okay, Now, ideally, you'd like to look at only enough nodes to be able to determine your move okay so you don't want to have to generate that entire tree if you can help it because the tree is huge it's going to take forever so we'll need to look at some techniques that we can do to cut down or that we can apply to cut down on the total number of nodes um, that you need to look at or that you need to generate so, I mean, for example, let, let's go back up here on figure 5.1, right? We'll finish up with this, right? If, you know, I'm generating all my nodes and if I'm doing a depth first search, right? Then I would head down the subtree that begins with its root as X in the upper left-hand corner. Now, if all the leaves in that subtree are plus ones for Max's point of view, What's the point in generating all the other subtrees, right? Does it matter? Because if you take your move where X is in the upper left-hand corner, that subtree, everything's a win, right? Plus one is plus one, right? No other subtree can generate a better result. So why even care about them? You could always just put the X in the upper left-hand corner and then go from there. Right? So you don't have to necessarily generate all of the nodes to determine what move you want. Now, this is also assuming that the AI, the human player, or if you got two AIs uh, playing against each other, playing the role of X, playing the role of O, we're assuming here that the player's always going to take the best move that it can. So we're eliminating, you know, building in stupidity uh, for this discussion. Okay, so anyway, that's going to bring section 5.1 to a close. So in the next video, we'll continue uh, talking about, you know, we'll continue with 5.2. We'll look at that algorithm uh, in more detail. Called it, it's called Minimax. And, uh, you know, I kind of walked you through how it works with the whiteboard and, you know, the, the, the figure of the partial search tree. So we'll dig into it uh, more in the next video. But... Um, as it turns out, the algorithm, it's, it's, if you can wrap your head around recursion, it's a freaking simple algorithm. There's not a whole lot there there. Um, you know, modifying it a bit to make it more efficient by using pruning, for example, that can add a little bit of complexity onto it, but not much. It's actually pretty elegant and it's actually uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, so 
Um, we'll, I'll leave you there. Um, I'll leave you there with that. And just remember, remind you to remember that, you know, as you're going through this, we're doing this online thing. Um, we're going to be doing this for a few weeks. And my own personal opinion, following the news, I'm a news junkie. Um, you know, I think I might have mentioned this in class. We're living through history here. Looking at the forecast, looking at the projections, it would not surprise me at all if we're doing this the rest of the semester, right? We're in for some stuff here with this, uh, with this pandemic. So don't be surprised, right? I have no special knowledge, you know, about the decisions that the university is making. This is purely my own opinion, but I would just say, you know, prepare to hunker down. We might be doing this the rest of the semester, okay? So, you know, I'm still, you know me in class, you know, I constantly am asking students, hey, how did I do? Did I explain that well? How are you doing? How are you feeling? How's the example going? Did my analogy work? You know, I need, the, with my lecturing style, I need feedback uh, from the students to know if I need to repeat something, how I deliver, how well I delivered the content. In this format, don't have that. So I just want to encourage you, if I misspoke on anything or if my explanation confused the hell out of you, made it worse, you know, email me at any time. I'm holding those virtual um, office hours through Blackboard. Hop on there, get clarification. Let me know, you know, what I need to repeat for you, what I need to clarify. Don't hesitate to ask any question, any time about anything, and I'll do my best to clarify uh, that for you. Right. So anyway. Talked long enough. That's that. Let me end this and post this up, and uh, and um, I'll get started. You know, this. I think this is gonna clear clear us all the way through Thursday. Um, you know, I think this will be enough content for this week's lectures. So we'll get you through these videos. We'll be done with this, and then the following week uh, we'll continue. Right. Um, anyway, I'm done. I'll shut up now. Uh, we'll see you next time.